All right, Law Venture, I have a special guest on this podcast episode. I'm with Christina Delise. Christina, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. So can you introduce yourself a little bit for those that don't know you? And then what we'll do is kind of talk about what you're passionate about, because speaking one on one with you, I know you you have some energy to bring to this episode. <laughs> Yeah, no one has ever said that I'm low energy. So uh, that <laughs> definitely is true. So hi, Love Venture. I'm Christina Delise. Um, I'm an attorney. I practice in pharmaceutical litigation, uh, plaintiff's pharmaceutical litigation specifically. Um, I was with Mark Lanier on his trial team for about eight years. And now I'm of counsel at Burn Charest, which is based out of Dallas. And um yeah, I love trials. I love trial prep. And as Jared knows, I'm very enthusiastic about all of these things. So when did you discover your passion for trial? You know, it was probably right off the bat. So I mean, I, I did high school speech and debate, which I would say was probably the most formative thing I ever did in my life. Mm -hmm. I did moot court in law school, and I absolutely loved both. So I knew for sure that litigation was going to be my thing. I really enjoy just figuring out how to take a complex topic and narrow it down and make it a really interesting and palatable presentation that anyone can understand. So I definitely knew I wasn't going to do, you know, transactional work or sit behind a desk all day. I definitely knew that I wanted to be in the courtroom and really figuring out how to how to present these stories and um, really get justice for clients in a big way. I love that. With moot court, did you find yourself enjoying it like you would with mock trial? Because moot court's a little bit more, let's talk about the law. It's more black and white to some extent, less color and less flavor involved. Uh, where, where did you gravitate in that situation? So I actually loved moot court because mm -hmm. I did moot court in such a way that I was like, nope, I'm going to have all the flavor and all the pizzazz <laughs> that I want to. Um, I actually, my 2L year won a national moot court competition and I compared deaths related to, let's see if I remember this right, deaths related to children taking energy drinks, consuming energy drinks. Mm -hmm. And I compared it to a couple of years ago or at that now more than a couple of years ago, but at that time, a couple of years ago, um, the mad cow disease outbreak in mm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I was always really trying to think of different ways to stand out and make it not boring, not so not so law heavy, I guess I want to say, yeah, yeah. you know, making it something that like even if your background is is not the law, you can understand why this is a problem and why it makes sense to go in this direction and vote in this direction. So you mentioned boring, not making it boring. What can lawyers do in the courtroom to be less boring? Because I think our default presentation by its very nature is very boring. I would have to agree with that. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of things that can be done. I would say, you know, the biggest thing that any trial attorney needs to keep in mind is that their objective is to engage the jury and empower them to deliver the best possible result for their client. And I think that sometimes we get so caught up in the law and the very specific, very in the weeds details that we don't always think, well, wait a second, we have presumably 12 lay people who probably don't want to be there how can we engage them and make them care? So one of my things is I'm a big demonstrative girl and I'm always like, how can we, how can we show in a unique, different and interesting, keyword being interesting way, the exact point that we're trying to make instead of saying, well, let's refer to this exhibit, page 395 of this medical report and this pathology says whatever, let's do it in a different way. So I think that whenever you can bring props into a courtroom, that's a huge thing. Another thing I think is just being genuine and authentic to yourself. You know, if you are the kind of person who would make a joke, you should probably make a joke. 
Mm -hmm. If you are not that kind of person, I would not recommend that. But I would say letting them see you as a person and not just as an attorney. Um, I think all those things are incredibly important to really building a connection because you want them to do two things, build a connection with your client, mm -hmm. but also build a connection with you and feel that what you're saying is true and that they can, that they can trust you. And if you're not authentic with who you are, they're not going to buy it. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption here that there's going to be some level of resistance to what you just said by some audience member, some lawyer somewhere, sure. because the thought process and the resistance I think is going to be okay. In order to make something interesting, it needs to be entertaining, but I don't want it to look like I'm treating this situation like a joke. Right. And right. balancing to where you still have serious, but entertaining. Can you kind of walk through that that balance that you have to strike? Absolutely. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head saying that there is a balance because there absolutely is. I'm certainly not suggesting go up and do a comedy show. You can approach a sober and serious topic while still being able to engage people in it. And it is definitely a fine balance that needs to be met. But as you kind of take baby steps into the direction of saying, you know what, how can we, how can we present this in an interesting way? You strike that balance. But I think that there's definitely a way to strike that balance where, you know, you're still absolutely like, this is something serious that happened, but you can present it in a different way. I think, you know, I, I think a good example of this is a couple of years ago, I was working on a case that um, my client passed away because of a pesticide uh, that caused non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, this was not a trial. This was for uh, a mediation. But I started the mediation statement, not with his injuries, not with his exposure, nothing like that. He passed away just a week shy of the 40 year wedding anniversary for him and his high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And I started with their love story. And by doing that, I was able to highlight this is not just someone you're reading about on paper. This is not just someone who we're looking at medical records. This was an actual man who had an actual family and he was stolen from them. So I think that there are definitely ways to rip an audience while still very much being respectful of just how somber and serious the situation is. I, I like that. And it seems like the concept of having something that's interesting and or entertaining is multidimensional, right? Like what you're talking about is depth to the story, but there's also presentation of that, of that story. And you mentioned demonstratives. So can you kind of give us, I guess, some more concrete examples of the demonstratives that you've used in the past? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of my favorite demonstratives was on one of my first cases, we represented a, um, a school district in San Antonio that had faulty uh, HVAC systems installed. They did not have any humidity controls. And as you can imagine, it gets hot in San Antonio. Um, so as a result of these faulty HVAC systems, this stacky botrys hazardous black mold just grew all over the schools. And it was disgusting. I did a walkthrough and the smell of the mold just smacked you in the face the mm -hmm. moment you walked in. So my idea was, well, let's do a jury field trip because if they go to the school, they're going to know right away, they're going to smell that smell and it's going to be game over. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately in Texas, there's a law that says you can't do a jury field trip in a civil case. So I was thinking like, well, what can we do to make it so they can still really understand beyond a photo? Mm -hmm. And there was a teacher's chair in one of the classrooms, very similar to, you know, just the chair that I'm sitting on right now. And it was covered in mold. It was a black chair that at that point was like white and gray because oh, of wow. this. So what we did was we got the chair, we put it in plexiglass, 
and we slapped a skull and crossbones sticker on the on the outside of the plexiglass. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a concrete way to show this is how bad it is. Like, this is what we're talking about. And that was, I'll be honest, the case settled on the eve of trial. So no one ever saw this demonstrative. <laughs> but even still, um, that I think would have been far more impactful than just looking at a photo of mold. Exactly. To really see it before your very eyes, because no parent would want their children to be in that kind of classroom. Another one, let's see, I have it right here. My trusty magic eight ball. Um, I represented a a restaurant who was charged just they were charged random water bills by their landlord. And there was no meter reading. There was no there was no sort of metric used to base these charges on. Some months it would be $4,000 for water. Other months it would be $12,000 for water. There was no rhyme or reason. So just like a magic eight ball, whatever I shake and get, that's mm -hmm. what, that's exactly what the bill was. So, I mean, I'm always about just using some interesting things to just engage in a different way. But another demonstrative that I think you know, is really like the unsung hero is just doing a simple roadmap, whether it's before a jury or in a deposition and just really showing whomever exactly where you're going and saying, you know what, we're going to hit these five, these five items. This is the order that we're doing it in. And that way they know, okay, so we've gone this far. This is how far we still have to go. Similar to Whoever's watching this YouTube video, there's going to be that little line at the bottom that shows how far we're going. That's something that I think is so important to say, you know what, you don't have to stare at the clock and wait for lunch. You know exactly how far you still have left to go. And it just keeps everyone kind of focused on the task at hand and and lets them be aware of like, OK, this is what we're doing and this is still where we need to go. Yeah, it allows just the jury to have a concept of of time right like you know it allows them to pace themselves because i do the same thing with tv shows i'm like how far into this episode am i it's not really totally. going anywhere uh right it's like can i get up for a snack now or do i are we almost done i'll wait <laughs> exactly exactly um i love that so what kind of resistance do you see from the other side when it comes to demonstratives because i feel like every time i try and introduce any demonstratives, the other side is just confused on, is this an exhibit? What's going on and how to handle it? Uh, what do you typically see? You know, I think it depends. I think if it's something like a roadmap, for instance, you mm -hmm. know, the defense attorneys that I, so what I, you know, pharmaceutical law is a very kind of niche group. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like everyone knows each other. We're kind of always against the same firms and the same attorneys. So like everyone kind of, you know, knows the deal at this yeah. point um you know one big thing for instance is um if you're doing a, a deposition for instance i like to take notes in a deposition mm -hmm. i like to make notes for a a deponent to respond to and i'll write down their answers you know something like that the biggest thing is like that has to be marked as an exhibit fine you know Jurors go, uh, excuse me, defense attorneys go back and forth, I would say, in terms of what they're, you know, how strenuously they're objecting, I would say, um, yeah. to the different demonstratives. Um, but I think it also really depends on the judge, because there's some judges, and I have been in courts where the judges are very, um, they don't want to see that. They want to see just the typical four corners of what you would expect. Mm -hmm. and. If that's your judge, you need to be aware of that. I certainly wouldn't say, yeah, now it's time to whip out a magic eight ball. If yeah. if you're, you know, you have a very serious judge who is not going to be open to that. So I think, you know, going back to what you were saying before about balancing, it really is, um, it really is a balancing act between really what the judge will allow. And then once you kind of understand what your playing field is in that way, you can really decide, you know, how you want to deal with any defense attorneys who are objecting. I would hope that the stingier judges are 
a vast minority because I would expect a lot of judges, they would want some type of intrigue, right? Like they, they would want some variety from what they typically see. I mean, that's been my experience. And I think that, you know, we're kind of at this new age of what it means to be a lawyer. And Jared, I think that you personally are a big part of that because I mean, even the whole idea of a virtual law firm, let's say, mm -hmm. this is something that like was never contemplated even just a few years ago. So I think we really are in this very interesting, this interesting moment in the profession in terms of, well, what can we do? How can we present our cases? How can we represent our clients? From where can we represent our clients? Um, so I think we're kind of like in that phase now that it's just kind of like, we'll feel it out and you know see how it goes. Um, but in my experience, a lot of the judges that I've dealt with have been kind of excited to see what, what the attorneys can come up with. What are your thoughts on video depositions, like Zoom depositions? So, you know, I've done plenty of Zoom depositions. A Zoom deposition doesn't personally bother me if everyone is remote. Uh -huh. I don't enjoy a Zoom deposition, and I actually usually don't participate in a Zoom deposition if it's going to be, you know, I'm deposing someone and they're in the same room as their counsel. If yeah. everyone is remote, that's totally fine. If not, Let's be, let's all be boots on the ground together. Yeah. I, uh, I asked that question because I was in a CLE and I can't remember the, def uh, the plaintiff lawyer's name, but she did a great job with recording her zoom depositions and creating basically a closing argument reel that hits the high points to where it's almost like a montage of jury. This is everything that you just saw and watched and that montage was super powerful. And so having your camera in front of you and a camera in front of the witness and maybe a camera in front of the defense lawyer, plus maybe another camera looking down at your demonstrative, like you can kind of change the pace, edit things up and, and create that intrigue, uh, that we're talking about in this, in this episode, uh, do you have any experience with that? Or have you, um, crossed paths with anyone who does something similar? So not with doing that specifically, like it sounds like she was doing it on her own, um, mm -hmm. which is awesome. That's yeah. great. Um, so a lot of my depositions historically have been recorded uh, and there'll be three camera depositions. So a lot of the times we'll have a, a camera on the witness on, you know, the Elmo or document camera and mm -hmm. on the questioning attorney. And then you know, historically, I've worked with different vendors who will do exactly that. They'll mash it up and make it something really just like interesting and enjoyable to watch. And we've used that primarily for deposition designations. Instead mm -hmm. of having to read them, we can play them in a way that just is more interesting and just, again, engages the jury in a different way. Um, so I definitely am all about that. And the fact that she can do that on her own, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, she she crushed it. Honestly, I got emotional just watching a case I didn't have any part in. She just like played a three minute probably reel of just all the points and just like, man, this is powerful. Uh, okay, so you teased this earlier. One thing I want to touch on definitely in this episode is the personality in the courtroom and being authentic to yourself. Let's establish a little bit of foundation, though. What is your personality? What's your like natural state of being? So, you know, it's kind of funny when I, uh, prior to going to law school, I was the deputy chief of staff for a state assemblyman. And when I was accepted to law school and told them I was going, I was told very directly that it was time to get serious, um, that I would have to be serious in law school. And that's just what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I am absolutely not a serious person. I'm very serious about my work and what I do. But in terms of just who I am as a person, I'm I'm jovial and the glass is always half full. And I really try to see the bright side and the positive of every situation. That's just really who I am. So I kind of made it my mission in law school and in the practice to not lose that. Um, because, you know, if you can, if you can hold on to yourself and really show the world who you are, whether it's 
with a jury, whether it's with a deponent, whether it's with your client or opposing counsel, it doesn't really matter. I think that that's always powerful. I think that just being genuine is kind of one of the biggest weapons that a trial attorney has in their arsenal. And being authentic to yourself really goes so far because so many people are not. And I think that a lot of times, you know, that if you're not being genuine to yourself, that's very easily snipped out and makes you lose credibility. It makes your client lose credibility inadvertently. And that's never what you want. So I was talking about something very similar with Eric Scrambling, which is an episode that hasn't been released yet, but we're going to we're going to tie it in anyways. Spoiler alert. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because I know early on as even a law student, we don't know what our style is. Like we kind of have to find our voice as a lawyer. And the only thing we really can do is kind of emulate the people that we see or that we connect with. And because of that, we're, you kind of have to automatically start in a not so authentic manner, but try and use that to find your voice, to develop and craft what is authentic to you. But at the same time, in my experience, maybe you can talk on this as well. In mock trial and moot court, you're judged by your presentation. And sometimes the judges are going to ping you if something seems a little bit more unorthodox compared to what they're used to seeing, right? You have coaches who coach all these teams for all these years. They know the safe, you know, this, this will put us in the best position. It's like, you're trying to sell a house and we know millennial gray is the best way to go. We're not going <laughs> to try and we're not going to try and Always. go out there beyond that millennial gray. Mm -hmm. So walk, walk me through kind of like your progress of, of finding your voice. And then ultimately, I guess, finding your confidence to double down on who you are. So, I mean, I think that I was kind of for moot court given a little bit of an unfair advantage because I did high school speech and debate, and mm -hmm. I actually was a national champion for high school speech and debate. So I really, from a very, very young age, was like, I see how everyone else is doing it, and that's fine and great, like good for them. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not how I'm going to do it. Again, what I said earlier, if you're the kind of person who would crack a joke, which I am, crack the joke, right? Yeah. Like, so that even from, you know, high school days, that was kind of always my style. When I got to uh, law school and moot court specifically, I think it definitely took my coaches a minute to kind of accept like, no, this is how I'm going to do it. And mm -hmm. it would be funny because, you know, obviously as part of moot court, you do these practice moots all the time. And I would try things out all the time. And sometimes they would literally stop me in the yard and be like, no, 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 we're, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, but I think that there is, you know, I, I think that I guess I, I figured out very early on in law school that what set me apart from everyone else was just my personality and really my unwillingness to conform. And it was like, you know what? I can't be the only one. Mm -hmm. I have to use that to my advantage. And the thing is, so I'm a, I'm a first generation attorney. I didn't know any attorneys growing up, but whenever we would have attorneys come to and specifically litigators would come to my law school and speak to us they were always kind of like these larger than life characters and i i mean that in the most respectful best possible way yeah and it was kind of like well if that's who they are why can't i just be who i am yeah it just seemed like everyone who was who wasn't just successful, but who really reached like the next level of success was just so comfortable and confident with who they were. And it was just love me or hate me. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that that just resonated with me, especially because I was in an environment that you do feel this need to conform and this need to fit into this very narrow lane. So when I would see them, it really kind of like gave me hope. And then when we would have, you know, attorney cocktail parties or, or you know, a mix and mingle with alumni or something, and I would speak to them, 
I would say, what's the one piece of advice? It was kind of like all that I would hear over and over again was mm -hmm. you need to be yourself. You need mm -hmm. to be authentic to who you are. And I was like, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So mm -hmm. I just kind of always went with that. And I definitely would not say that I'm definitely not everyone's cup of tea, right? And like, <laughs> I can, I can respect that. Like, that's totally fine. But I think that once you kind of make the decision that, you know what, I'm just going to be me and I trust myself and I trust my judgment, especially when it comes to my clients, it just kind of like all falls into place, I would say. I don't want to overlook something that you said that really hit home with me. I have so much respect for you saying that you were trying different styles, different techniques that sometimes worked, sometimes didn't, but you at least tested it out mm -hmm. in law school. And I'm guilty of this to some extent as well. It's always the appearance of like, yeah, I don't want anyone to see me, you know, stumble at some point. And then probably in your second or third year, you're like, guys, we're all stumbling. Like we're, we're yeah, just stumbling down fine. this hill together. Right. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's a lot of growth to be made by testing different things out and to be willing to experience things that just, I mean, that don't go well, right? Like you, you get kind of, I don't know, you, you get your coach upset with you because it's like, that wasn't your best day. And I was like, well, I was trying a little bit of a different style on cross today. So like, let me, let me see if I can find, um, something a little bit more effective than what I've been doing. And so, uh, I, I, have a lot of respect of not taking the cookie cutter approach, figuring out what's going to be best for you and then ultimately developing your style. Where does your style come out the most during trial? Is it jury selection when you kind of get to start interacting with people? I would say that my personality really comes out a lot behind the scenes okay. in terms of just making the, the story, right? So like my big thing is, I have a lot of big things, as you can see. I really love demonstratives, but I'm also really into exhibits. I love discovery. I love trying to figure out the hot docs in the case and really weaving them together in a way that shares, that shows, you know, not only liability, but also motive and, you know, all the other things that we're looking for. But I think that there's definitely something to be said about, um, you know, just behind the scenes and really figuring out, well, like, these are the hot docs, and this is the order that we're doing it in. And I think that that's an area that there is more room for creativity than people would realize. Because depending on even the order in which you present your hot docs, you could be telling different stories inadvertently. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's always room, especially behind the scenes, to be creative. And I think that that's an important point because, again, I'm not suggesting that like every trial attorney goes out there and is just kind of larger than life with the jury and, you know, makes it into a spectacle. That's not at all what I'm saying. When I'm talking about like being creative and letting your personality shine through, there's so many ways to do that behind the scenes. And I think even, you know, you talking about the CLE, you saw the CLE that you saw that mm -hmm. the attorney was able to like weave that video deposition. That's another way to just show a personality and to be creative. So I think there's so many ways to do that both inside and outside the courtroom. So I think starting outside of the courtroom is a really great way to kind of like test it out because people aren't going to see it necessarily. So to your point earlier, you know, you don't want people to see you fail, right? Or try something new. Well, if you're just doing it behind the scenes with your team, like we're all figuring it out together. That's yeah. fine, you know? When I edit a video, and I've been editing videos since high school, um, now with Law Venture, I have an editor, so it gets a little bit easier. But when I edit videos, it's like, okay, I'm gonna dump the entire footage on the timeline. If I were to upload that, I'm pretty sure everyone would bounce. Like nobody would be watching Law Venture right now because it'd be too long, way too much information. And the real magic is cutting, 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 removing, simplifying. 
as much as possible to get to the meat of what needs to be presented. Can't tell you how many comments I get where it's like, bro, you're rambling too much, like get to the point. And it's like, okay. Um, how, how do you do that whenever you're strategizing for trial, for developing the story? You talk about the exhibits, like that's part of the story you're trying to tell and the presentation of it, you're like, you're spot on because if you present something too early, then it shifts the mindset a little bit from the juror's perspective. So my whole thing in terms of, you know, hot docs, for instance, mm -hmm. is you want to populate your exhibit list with hot docs. And when I say hot, I mean like fire emoji hot documents. If you're looking at a document and you're not sure if it's a hot doc, it's not. It's maybe lukewarm and lukewarm is going to get you a lukewarm verdict. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're striving for bigger and better, right? So I'm always looking for documents that are just so obviously beneficial to our case or obviously detrimental to defendant's case that they require little to no explanation. You know, a document that it's just so clear and so clean that anyone off the street, like a juror, mm -hmm. could look at it and say, ah, this is why this is important here. I think that sometimes it's like so easy to because you so intimately know your case and all the and all the documents and your whole story. I think it's so easy to get kind of lost in the weeds and you're not looking at the whole picture. And the whole picture is like this bad thing happened. This is why this is the result, you know, and if you kind of look at it like that. It's like, how can we use the least number of documents to show that? Mm -hmm. That's another thing. I'm always thinking, like, what is the least that we can do? Because if you think about it, every document that you put up, every witness that you put up, it's a chance to change the story. And it's a risk that you could hurt what you've already established. So... I'm always like less is more is really the way to do it. And um, I'm always just trying to think like big picture. How can I make the greatest impact with using just a few documents, for instance, to really tell the story and make it just like simple and clean? I'm going to ask a question that I don't know if it's going to be easy to answer. And so it may just be as simple as it depends. How do you strike that balance of simplifying the documentation while also making it clear that if there are bad facts that you want to draw the sting out of, like you're being upfront and you're giving the whole truth and you're providing those documents as well, instead of the, the other side saying, no, 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 like we have this one right here. How does that go into the analysis? You know, I think that's such a great question. And I think that the biggest thing is to be upfront with those bad documents. So I'm talking about, you know, just sharing the story just in a simple way. However, if there are bad facts, you definitely want to proactively bring those up and you want to have documents that neutralize those bad facts because you absolutely are right. You never want a, a defense attorney to be able to say, well, you're cherry picking. This is not this is not the whole truth, right? Because it all goes always, it goes back to your credibility. Mm -hmm. So if there is something negative out there, you want to be able to raise that for sure up front and overtly. But you also want to be able to say, Oh, but here are three documents in addition that neutralize whatever bad fact this is. And that's that's a hard concept of whittling a case down, I think, for anyone, especially because it's like from a personal injury standpoint, you have maybe seven injuries that you're dealing with. But the stub toe, like, is that one we really want to start and you know to prove up and start arguing about a stub toe compared to something that's way more severe? But it feels it feels like we're giving something up in that situation. And I think the big the big transition that a lot of plaintiff lawyers are making these days, dropping the economics, just proving up the non-economic damages. And it feels like you're kind of giving something up. But in reality, I think we're starting to have more data points that pursuing non-economics alone is potentially going to be a more successful route. Um, any thoughts on on that? You know, it's 
it's definitely, again, I think that this goes back to that we are kind of at this like new age of what it means to be a plaintiff's attorney. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it done very successfully both ways. So I think it really depends on, you know, what exactly happened to this client. I think that there's something very powerful about pursuing non-economic damages and looking at the person again as a whole going back to that love story and just focusing on this is the person and this is how their life changed um but again i i definitely hear what you're saying about like well you don't want to like lose that other piece so i really do think that it's it's a difficult balance to make and it's it's going to depend on the case so for anybody watching trying to get the concept of just the practicality what is your caseload looking like because if it's a small number you can do deep dives of like story you know and figuring out all these documents with with a large team so okay that's one concept to consider versus somebody who has maybe smaller cases but a lot of them and they're trying to you know manage their time so i mean my practice really over the past like almost decade has has kind of shifted in different ways and at different times i'm doing different things so mm -hmm. You know, again, I do pharmaceutical law, so mass torts. There have been times that I was managing an internal docket of 17,000 cases. Uh. That it was just like, I mean, very, as I'm sure you can imagine, stressful, involved, all of that. Um, my, I would say, my bread and butter has kind of, kind of falls into two buckets. So, Historically, I've been part of um, different uh, MDL, multi-district litigation leadership groups that have, you know, are working with the court, with the defendants on litigating the cases on a global scale. So beyond just who my personal clients are. I've also been in the other bucket where, um, you know, sometimes months oftentimes weeks before trial, um, my team would be called in to be special trial counsel for a case. And in that instance, which is kind of like one of my favorite things, you know, these attorneys had already worked up the case, discovery was complete, and they just kind of, you know, wanted some, you know, an extra set of eyes to see like, how can we present this case for the biggest impact? Mm -hmm. So that has always been super fun for me. But I mean, I'll, I'll say this, you know, I, I spend years preparing for a trial. Um, that's just kind of like the nature of my practice. Um, I'm certainly not one of those attorneys who has trial, you know, once a month or once every couple of weeks, like yeah. that's amazing. Um, Depends on who you ask. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm in awe of those people. Um, <laughs> that has not been my practice. So I, I do have the opportunity to definitely deep dive into those cases, but in a situation where, you know, I'm brought in four weeks before trial, then it's just kind of like, for those four weeks, nothing exists but that trial. Yeah. And what is, what would you say is your playbook of making a trial interesting as a bare minimum, right? Like, I come to you and like, we have a trial in two hours. Like, let's, let's try and make this as interesting as possible. We've talked about roadmaps. We've talked about maybe something tangible. Are there any things that you think like, no matter what trial I'm going in, is, this is what I'm going to implement as a demonstrative or something that's going to automatically add additional value. Well, I would say the biggest thing to add value is to highlight your client, okay. who they actually are. So if they are a family man, highlight that. If they volunteered an animal shelter, highlight that. If they are, you know, doing some sort of challenge that for this year, they said they're going to read 100 books and they're up to 89 books so far. Whatever it is, I would say if you can throw in just facts about your client to really humanize them beyond whatever happened to them, beyond whatever brought us there on that day, um, I think that that always 
always goes far because you don't know what's going to hit someone differently. And um, just showing that these are real people and that this could happen to anyone and this is not, you know, some sort of anomaly, unfortunately, is, I think, incredibly powerful. And hopefully, if, you know, trial is in two hours, you've taken the time to get to know your clients so that can easily be weaved in and, um, you know, explained. Are you in the camp where the people who are describing the client is not actually the client themselves, but the surrounding folks? Yeah, absolutely. I want to hear, I'm much more interested about what someone has to say about my client mm -hmm. and you know, their personality and just who they are and then their injuries and how things are different for them um, post-injury. I'm much more interested in that than hearing whatever, you know, someone has to say about themselves. And I think, you know, to me, that just makes sense because, um, you know, if you look at, for instance, like, I don't know, like a dating website, for instance, if you were to write a blurb about yourself, like, what do you write? How do you capture who you are, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, it's not going to sound right, right? Like, maybe that's, you know, but if you had your friends write it about you or your brother or your sister, maybe they'll be able to capture you in a different, more accurate way. And I kind of look at it like that. I think it's very difficult for people just in general to speak about themselves. You know, if you were like, even when we started and you were like, tell me about yourself. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that's, I think, a lot more difficult to do and a lot more difficult to really accurately convey than maybe someone speaking on your behalf. I don't think I've ever purchased an item from Amazon without reading the reviews. Same, same. Yeah. So the witnesses are the reviews, guys. Like that's, yeah. that's what it is. 100%. So part, the benefit of me doing these episodes is I get to like ask questions that only apply to me and will probably only benefit me. But uh -huh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do that. I have a case where my client is a stripper, okay. personal injury case, and I'm immediately concerned about the judgment of my client being a stripper and it's a high damages case. And I am trying to figure out how to weave in a linear fashion, that story in front of the jury. And if you just hear stripper, your mind goes one direction, but her actual background, great girl. She, before her injury was helping in a hospital, elderly patients, you know, be able to recover from traumatic events in the elderly patients lives. She fitness fanatic and just had a lot going for her. had super tragic injury that resulted from somebody's negligence that she may never be able to like fully use her leg again, um, in, in a normal fashion. And the way she described it was she decided to get into pole dancing as like a way to maintain her fitness. But the way the justification for becoming a stripper was she now feels like she's in control of, of her life. Like it, there's a level of empowerment that she experiences from that compared to whenever the injury happened, she couldn't even control her body, right? Like her body won't move where it's supposed to move. Um, so how, putting you on the spot, how would you tell that story? Are you, I, I, it sounds like let's just have family friends help paint the picture before, but I'm afraid as soon as the word stripper comes out, like the mind starts going where, where I don't want it to go. Well, I would try to use the word dancer instead of stripper. Okay. You know, I think it depends. So what, um, why, so it's not that she, so she decided to do this just to like empower herself. Yeah. I mean, this, this was a year and a half after, after the, uh, injuries she suffered and the surgeries that she's had. Um, so it wasn't anything on the radar until basically the last month or so. So this is, this is a new development. You know what? I think that there's a lot of power just in the truth. I would yeah. just tell the story of like, you know, she had this accident happen. 
it sounds like it was a terrible accident. As part of her fitness, she decided that she was going to do this. And then she she finally felt like she had control after not having control because of her accident for so long. So this is what she does now. But I would also fill it in with different things about her. Like, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not just a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. You're a lawyer. You're not just a lawyer. Everyone's so multifaceted. So I would also pepper in, you know, other facts about her too. And you know what? This is a woman who something terrible happened to her that now she's empowered to really have control of her body. Good for her. That's the thing I don't want to shy away from, right? Like, it's like, I don't want to... I don't want to keep that quiet, but it's, yeah. And you know let's, what? Let's You're, you also don't want to condemn her, like by not mentioning it. Like that's like condemning her. Like yeah. no, you know what? You go, girl. Do your thing, right? Like yeah. you, she's taking control in a big way. Yeah, and now, now she has like the finances to be able to put all of her pets like on pet uh insurance and stuff like that like that's that's the first thing she talked about she's like now i can take care of my dogs and and everything loves animals yeah great fantastic um yeah so it's those situations where figuring out when to be upfront about a bad fact you know obviously defense is going to want to spin that and it's like do you take them down the journey and and then provide the the bomb of like, Hey, this is how we got here. Or do you front load it? Um, even during opening, right? Like front load it, but say, this is how she ultimately got to that path. Where, where is your mindset of like early, early before the justification or timeline and be a little bit more linear with it? You know, I could really see it going either way. I think it really depends on what venue you're in, mm -hmm. in terms of like how conservative the jury pool is. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an area that like maybe they're not so conservative, I would I would bring it up in opening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of, about. Like this is her profession. This is what she's doing. Um, if you're in an area that's a little bit more conservative, I would say, you know, paint her as everything she is outside of being a dancer mm -hmm. and then add that in. So at that point, the jury has kind of already started to connect with her and feel, you know, feel that energy, like feel yeah. her energy and yeah. then throw it in. I, I think it really depends on the venue in that situation. Okay. That's super helpful. And I think that's hopefully a, concrete way to where people can kind of start seeing the process of like all right this is how you handle things this is how you present things um, yeah there's definitely not like a bright line rule with any of this it really is it, like it's, it's talking it do... out yeah and quite frankly it's always just like let me make my best guess right and my best like judgment call right and that's kind of all you can do i think i know the answer just based on the size of cases that you handle but i could be wrong do you use focus groups always yeah always what do you what have you learned using focus groups everything i mean <laughs> it, it so i remember my first focus group i was just so blown away so i have never personally served on a jury uh-huh um i was just so blown away to learn um what facts the members of the focus group would hang on to totally uh, what facts did that did not exist. They were interjecting into the story mm -hmm. um, to see what they really understood and what they didn't and kind of like how, you know, it's, it's interesting. So the first, the first case that I ever did a focus group for um, was that mold case, that school mold case. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that in the first focus group we did, one of the juries, because I've done it with like multiple juries at once, uh, you know, mock juries at yeah. once. Um, one of the juries was like, oh my gosh, all these children are dying. We're going to have to pay for all the, they're going to have to pay for all these funerals. Mm-hmm. No children were hurt. 
nothing that that was completely not part of the story that yeah. did not happen the yeah. children were removed it was just a matter of remediating the mold situations in the school building a new school if it was needed like no one was hurt and they came back and they were like yeah this company needs to pay at least a billion dollars and something like that to me was just so eye-opening because it's like yeah so it's in our favor in this instance right but it yeah. could just as easily go in the opposite direction and mm -hmm. again like no one was sick that was literally never part of the case not anything like that was ever said so i mean it just kind of really like blows your mind and i would say if you have the opportunity to do a focus mm -hmm. group you absolutely should if you can even just watch focus groups on youtube for cases you're not involved in mm -hmm. like that's also great because i would say that the more you do focus groups the more you just kind of understand what jurors hear and what they don't hear, what they see and what they don't see. And again, what they interject that's not there. And that is like very helpful when you're building a case and trying to figure out how you want to make this presentation. Because at the end of the day, everyone comes to a jury having lived X years of life, having X life experiences, mm -hmm. right? So you don't, you never know what someone's going to bring in. So to the extent that you can like preemptively prepare for any of that, that can be incredibly helpful. Honestly, if anyone wants to see a parallel to a focus group in action, watch a reality TV show that's like hot and then go search the comments and reactions on Twitter and you'll get so many people taking different stances on the same episode that everyone's watched right it's totally like, like this person's motive is this no this person's motive is that this person's right. great this person's not and you can see the thought process everyone has the same same information right everyone sees the same episode but you get people all over just like debating what's happening uh with just trash tv but that right there like is i think good inside of where the mind goes of trying to figure out like the motive right like like people want to know motive and so maybe that's part of the story that you need to start making very clear for the jury of like what the why not just the black and white facts uh so that's it's always Absolutely. something where i just as you navigate life you're like yeah, i could take a little bit of this take a little bit of that implement it in my legal career Definitely. But I mean, I am such a fan of a focus group. And like, if you ever have the opportunity to work with a jury consultant or like a trial scientist, mm -hmm. I mean, those folks, they just, they get it on like a completely different level. And I mean, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with some of the absolute best. And I mean, there's always something to learn and there's always something to you know, a different approach to put into whatever you're doing. And, you know, you carry it with it from case to case. Oh. Then, So I'm always like, if you can even do it for one case, I think it's just so well worth it. I know of a lawyer who he's basically been building an email list for a focus group to just email and say, hey, can anybody do a Zoom meeting at this time to listen about a case? And I think he does like $50 Amazon gift cards for anyone who shows up. And so whenever he needs a focus group, he just sends out an email and people hop on. I did one with him. And the style of that one was, Jared, just present the case, black and white, no flavor. Let's just see what the response is. Do you, are your focus groups to where they're being presented from two sides or do y'all try and be as neutral as possible? No, we'll present them from two sides. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what's the best way to get like the truest result from both sides what do you mean to where i mean obviously if you're on the plaintiff side like you're a little bit more heavy-handed and your heart's over here and not on the defense side so how do you keep yourself in check uh in that situation well you know i mean i think that like part of your job of course is to be not just aware, but hyper aware of any bad facts in your case, any mm -hmm. bad exhibits, any bad testimony, just any bad anything. Mm -hmm. So I mean, in that sense, I think it's almost easier sometimes to play the defense attorney in that role, because 
you need to be, and you want to make sure that you are laying it on thick because mm. that's what the defense attorneys are going to do. So, you know, of course your instinct is like, well, this is my case. Obviously, I think this is a good case for X, Y, and Z reasons, yeah. but you really need to just give it your all and put on your best defense attorney hat because, you know, the competition is fierce and, and quite frankly, you're not doing a focus group for a case that's like a slam dunk that you're like, this is going to settle anyway, right? Like yeah. you're doing a focus group because you want to learn more before trials. So there's mm -hmm. obviously a reason and there are enough bad facts that you're like, no, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think you just need to like lean into it and just have fun with it. I mean, I've always been a plaintiff's attorney. Um, so it's like, if you can ever pretend to be a defense attorney, it's just like a fun <laughs> exercise. That's great. That's great. I love it. Okay. So I think we can probably keep going, but I'm going to stop us here. Christina, thank you so much for such great information. And I'm going to peer pressure you to keep coming back and hopefully make more content so we can keep benefiting the law venture community. But it's been a pleasure and thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun and I would absolutely love to peer pressure away. So. <laughs> <laughs>